Acts chapter number 22. We'll begin reading in verse number 25. <clears throat> and the Bible says, And as I bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. Now, we could have read the 24 verses before where we picked up today. And it is the story of how the Apostle Paul comes back from a very long missing journey. And he's visited several cities. And I believe the last one that they visited before they came back to Jerusalem was uh, Ephesus. And that's where you find the story of everybody meeting in the city and uh, in the city square, and they were praising Diana and claiming that Diana was the goddess of their city. And then the Apostle Paul, after that whole ordeal, comes back. He gets to what would nowadays, or a little bit later, be called Syria, and they go up to Jerusalem. They tarried for a while with some of the brethren in Tyre, and then they. You know, the Apostle Paul told Luke at one point, we're not going up right now. And then seven, it says a few days later, about seven days, then they went up. And as he went up, a brother in the faith comes with the Holy Ghost all over him, takes the Apostle Paul's girdle or his belt, bands his own hands and feet and says, they're going to do this to the one who owns this girdle once you get to Jerusalem. And they, the people that were traveling with Paul tried to talk him out of going to Jerusalem. They said, hey, you, we don't want you ended up in jail. And the Apostle Paul rebukes them. And he says, why, in no less terms, are you breaking my heart by not letting me go to Jerusalem? He said, I've been prepared to die in Jerusalem, wherever God wants me to die, but for the honor and glory of Jesus Christ. He says, you're going to rob me if I don't get to go to Jerusalem and have the Lord's will fulfilled in my life. This is before the Apostle Paul received the promise from the Holy Spirit that, you know, take care, you've got to go before Caesar before you can die. He's already thinking, when next time I step foot in Jerusalem, it's going to be the last time that I step foot anywhere. But he was ready to go. And the story that we just read is after the Apostle Paul's purified, he pulled a brother Randy and with the other men that appeared to fight themselves, he, he shaved his head. He's no more hair. He goes into the temple with those men, and the people in the temple recognized him. Even though he didn't have no hair, they recognized him. And then they took him into captivity. They take him before the Romans, and they've had this big trial. The Apostle Paul pulls a little bit of you know, intelligent maneuvering and notice that the people that were trying him, half of them were Pharisees, half of them were Sadducees. He said, well, if I can get them arguing among themselves, they're not going to be able to convict me. So that's what he did. And really all that he brought up was, hey, all I'm talking about is Jesus being resurrected and living again. And then that tore them all apart. They were arguing with each other. So the centurion that was standing by said, they're going to kill that guy in the middle of that arguing. And they said, I'm going to take him and I'm going to scourge him so that we can get the truth out of them. They said, I'm tired of this debacle. Let's just figure out what's going on. So as they take the Apostle Paul captive, they're tying his hands with leather straps. And he says, you know, we read the story. Verse number 25, as they bound, he said, is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? In other words, the Apostle Paul said, are what you doing, or is what you're doing, right can you punish a man that one has a name and two is uncondemned in other words there's nothing that's been proved you cannot be condemned until after a judgment has been delivered nowadays that's what we would call sentencing you can be found guilty but then there's the sentencing phase what is the payment that you must make for your guilt well, the Apostle said, they haven't even said that I've done anything wrong. But that's not what caught the Romans' attention. He said, is it lawful for you to scourge a Roman? Okay, then the centurion, 
when he heard it, verse number 26, told the chief captain. In other words, he went straight to the general and said, hey, we got to be careful what we do to that guy. He claims to be a Roman. He doesn't believe him, but he put enough fear into him that he went and told the captain. He said, take heed. Guy claims to be one of us. So then, verse number 27, the chief captain came and said unto him, tell me, art thou a Roman? Captain says, I want to hear for myself. Are you claiming to be a citizen of Rome? And then it says, he said, talking about Paul, yay. In other words, yep. Centurion that went and told this captain, we don't find that he told the captain anything. He said, hey, there's a guy down there claims to be a Roman. The captain said, I'm going to go take care of this. I want to be want to be sure. He says, I'm not going to leave this to one of the centurions. But the centurion had anywhere between 100 and 1,000 men underneath him. That, he, that guy's in charge. But the captain says, I'm not going to leave it to one of the centurions. I'm going to make this decision because that's how important it was. But even after Paul says, yay, captain doesn't believe him. Verse number 28, he says, And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. He's looking at Paul and he says, You don't look like somebody that can buy their freedom. Right. Now, we mentioned there were those that had purified themselves after the law and were getting ready to go into the temple. And James and the other disciples at Jerusalem talked him into joining that group that were going to go and purify themselves. Okay, so he's got plain garments on. And we've already mentioned he shaved his head. He has humbled and, you know, put himself below the lowest of the low so that when he went into the house of God, he was showing God how serious he was about purifying himself, not after the things of the world, but after the Spirit. Did he have a clean shirt on? Absolutely. But was it ornate? No. In fact, most likely, it was probably made out of linen. Probably white. Or if not white, off-white, but one color woven throughout. Nothing out, you know, the ordinary for that time, but nothing extraordinary either. And the captain looks at him and he says, Are you sure you're a free man? He says, It cost me a whole lot to get my freedom. The captain's a free man. He bought his citizenship into Rome. That means that that captain probably was the citizen of an invaded country or an invaded nation that had been taken either captive or had been turned into a slave and rose up through the ranks of the military until one, he was getting paid, and in two, he was getting paid so much that he bought his citizenship. They say, it took me a lot of blood, sweat. He may have had to kill many a people. All the while, that captain's just saying, if I can make it one more day, tomorrow might be the day that I can buy my citizenship into Rome. Because see, it was very important back in those days to be a citizen. If you were a Jew but not a Roman, you couldn't freely travel. You would most likely be born, raised, marry, and die in the area that you were born into. You could not go up to Jerusalem if you were not from Jerusalem. You had to have papers. In fact, this captain is the one that takes Paul later in the next chapter, after he finds out that uh, from the Apostle Paul's nephew, that there's a conspiracy to kill him. This is the captain that writes and says, send him to the governor, Felix. You had to have the governor or one of the captains of the army prepare documents, sign it, put their name and seal to it, that said you were allowed to travel before you could travel. There were gatekeepers at the city. They checked for papers. Or an emissary, a messenger, would be sent in front of you that said, hey, we're sending so many people, and these are their names. If their name isn't on the list, they can't get into the city. You don't think that it was the providence of God that the Apostle Paul, when he was called to be the Apostle Paul, was a citizen and was freely able to travel throughout the Roman Emperor or the Empire. Well, what about the other parts? I don't know. Issue never came up. But I do know that they stayed at Jerusalem. Was it that they weren't able to travel? I don't know. But there are some 
the beloved physician Luke, he traveled every, well not everywhere, but traveled a lot with Paul. Titus, Timothy, those that the Apostle Paul sent to these other churches. Everywhere that the Apostle Paul went, the Roman Empire was there too. But for them to be able to freely travel so easily, they had to have been citizens. Because they couldn't go wherever they wanted. They were subjects if you weren't a citizen. That's why the Roman, before he knew that Paul was Roman, or Roman, he could have beat him. He could have done everything but killed him without cause. In fact, that's why the Romans could say, hey, carry my luggage a mile. And Jesus said, if a man compelled thee, that means you didn't have a choice. To go with him a mile, go them twain. Why did Jesus say it? Because there was a law that said Romans are above everybody else. Their priorities, their needs, they take precedent. And that Roman captain said those privileges, that identity, that citizenship is so valuable that he did unspeakable things. He enforced rules and laws that he may not have personally agreed with. He may have done things that were contrary to his very nature, because I believe he was a decent man. He went, one, and came down and personally investigated a claim. He could have very easily, like the Roman centurion told Jesus, he said, if I give a command, it's done. He said, if you say the word, my daughter will be healed. You're Lord over everything. Everything obeys you. Certainly the captain could have said, well, go and investigate to that centurion. The centurion would have gone back and investigated He'd ask Paul for documents or for proof or for a lineage where he was born. And everything would have been documented because back then they kept those things in the town that you were born in. But this captain went down and saw to it personally. When he looked at Paul, he didn't dismiss him. He said, well, it might have been laundry day. Maybe this is all that he had. Well, his head looks freshly shaven, so, I mean, at least he's got money for a razor. I don't know. But see, this centurion, he was thinking of things the way that he had done it. He's trying to hold the Apostle Paul to the standard of himself. I believe that this man was probably older than Paul. He said it took a great sum to obtain his freedom. You don't get a great sum in a short period of time. In fact, for him to be a captain, that means that he progressed through the ranks farther than just one or two promotions this guy was one of the people that directly answered to Felix the governor who directly answered to Caesar this guy's three or fourth in line in the chain of things he's high up there that's why he had the paycheck but before he could have had that position he had to be a citizen so it took him some while it took him a while I believe that this man was aged, but I believe he also had a little bit of wisdom because he asked the Apostle Paul, how did you get your freedom? He said, how, how did you become a Roman? He said, you don't look like nothing. He said, didn't guys are arguing over, you didn't put up a fight. He goes, I've seen innocent men, they put up a fight. He's look, he says, something doesn't add up here. And then the Apostle Paul said, but I was free born. And then the centurion and the captain both look at each other. I can see it happening. And they go, makes sense. Because what happens in verse number 29? Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman because he had bound him. He said, oh, we messed up. Straightway they said, sorry. They cut the leather straps off of him and they got out of Dodge real quick. Because they said, we messed up. Because they could do whatever they wanted to to a non-citizen. But if they were a citizen, even binding a free man was considered enough cause for both of them and not only to lose their job, but probably for their whole family to be ostracized. Because they revered each other's citizenship. The other man's freedom. Now, I know what some of y'all probably already think, this ain't got nothing to do with the corona. Not going to mention nothing about it, but there's a whole lot of implication in there 
that if other people respected others' freedom as much as that centurion and that chief captain did, yeah. we wouldn't be in the situation we're in right now. Right. But that's not what we're going to teach on today, Brother Randy. <laughs> Instead, what we're going to teach on is that why we spent so much time in verse number 28 is that relationship between that chief captain and the apostle Paul. Why was that chief captain so astonished to think that that man could be free? And the Apostle Paul was born with something that that man spent so many years, so much effort, so much investing in something that he so much wanted to be a part of. I mean, he was called a Roman soldier, but he wasn't a Roman. He wanted to be a Roman so bad. He was owned by Rome in the eyes of Rome, but he wasn't a part of Rome. But the Apostle Paul was born into everything. He got it freely. Yeah. It was his by birth. Yeah. Well, I find that when I got born again, I was made a new creature. Well, Brother Randy, Brother Aaron, because I have to look up here at the camera anyway. We, as Christians, when we received that new birth, we were freely entitled to some things. Yeah. But again, here's a catch. The Apostle Paul could have kept his mouth shut and they'd have bound him, scourged him, probably beat him within an inch of his life. Right. All in a pursuit of what they were claiming would have been truth. They were trying to get a confession out of him. Trying to figure out what he did. They said, if we cause enough pain, he'll confess to something. But if he wouldn't have opened his mouth and said, but I'm a Roman. Wouldn't have mattered that he was freeborn. Wouldn't have mattered that he was a citizen. Wouldn't have mattered that these men were breaking the law because he wouldn't have told nobody about it. If you don't actively use what God freely gave you, it's worthless. But see, this centurion, or the chief captain of the centurion, he had spent so much time, effort, money. The world craves what we have so much. That they give themselves over. They make themselves a slave to ideologies and to principles and to a lifestyle all in the hope that one day they can have what we freely have. They sell themselves out for it, but so many Christians don't just claim what God has already freely given them. Yeah, right. We live so far below our station in the eyes of God because in our mind we cannot reconcile that we really are what God made us into. So, what are some of those things? Well, first off, we've already mentioned some of these, but we're going to go into a little bit more detail. This chief captain. One of the things as a Christian, they, things you're born with as a Christian. You're born with association. A Roman has a right to all things that are Rome. A Roman can go anywhere in Rome. He can hang out with Romans. I mean, Jews hung out with Jews. That was their criticism of Jesus. You weren't a Jew if you didn't live by the Jewish law. You was an infidel. You were an unbeliever. Or you were sinful. You were unclean. You couldn't be a Jew of the Jews unless you did everything right. What did they say of Jesus? He was the friend of publicans and sinners. He don't hang out with Jewish people. He, he hangs out with people that are below Jewish. Well, this world sells their soul for association for friendships for recognition for belonging to something well I was born a new birth I was adopted by the father and one day we'll marry into the family yeah. we're so associated with God that God put his stamp on it that said there's no way they won't be associated with me hey. we are threefold the child of a king because in the eyes of God, the marriage supper's already happened. He's been there. He's seen it. The Apostle John saw it. He saw the marriage of the church to Christ. So in the eyes of God, you are threefold his child. So God's not only said it, his word's forever settled. So if he says it three times, how settled is that? There are those that hope to know enough people that they can call in enough favors to one day get whatever it is that they truly desire. I'm told that if I ask, I shall receive, seek, and I shall find, knock, and it shall be opened unto me. 
And if it isn't, it's because I ask according to my own lust that I may consume what I desire rather than what God would desire for me. Association, people think, brings benefits. You ever heard the phrase rubbing elbows with? That means you don't belong, but you're trying to elbow your way in. Yeah. Trying to squeeze your way into something in just the hopes that your life will get a little bit better. You ever been a part of those meetings where everybody laughs at a joke that's not funny because they're hoping to try and impress somebody? But is it? It's phony, but they're trying to get association. Well, the world hopes to associate with God. They can't even fathom being a part of what God's doing. They just want to be just noticed. They want to be an acquaintance. They want to be someone that if they were to call up God, He could say, oh yeah, I remember you. That's what they long for. This captain, his entire life, had devoted everything that if he needed a favor, somebody real high up in the chain would have responded. He wrote a letter, or a letter personally to Felix, used his own name because he said, Felix knows me. Felix will take care of Paul because he recognizes my name. We're associated with each other. The world just wants to be noticed by God. They may not claim that it's got to be some higher power. They want fortune to smile upon them and give them what they've always desired. But I've got everything that I could ever dream of. I was born with association. I was born... We'll save that for the next one. Almost skipped a point. But I can freely enter the throne room of God as a priest that he made me into when he saved me. I can, in the eyes of God, stand right before God's throne and make my petitions known unto God. Personally, no priest in between us. Don't have to go through a mediator except the mediator Christ Jesus. And then as a result, God sees it as if I personally asked it to him and he personally delivered the answer through the Holy Spirit. Don't you think that's association? See, this Roman, he understood that if Paul wrote a letter to somebody higher up the ladder, that it would be noticed because Paul was born a Roman. They threw the letters out that weren't from Romans. They said, we don't have time for that. We've got to take care of our own. But what, how many Christians don't take advantage? I mean, in the, eyes of, in the Old Testament, we could go to the, the account of the story where God sent the pillar of cloud out of heaven and it stood before the door of the tabernacle while Moses and Joshua were inside the tabernacle. Joshua didn't even want to look at the pillar. He knew something was up. He fell on his face in the middle of the temple or the tabernacle and just said, hey, I don't know what's going on. I'm going to start praying. Moses goes to the door of the tabernacle and the Bible says that God spoke to Moses out of the cloud face to face as a friend. Well, there's a whole other thought that I wonder, when did God show that to Moses? Because Moses wrote that book. Did Moses understand at that moment that God was this far away from him? Because he couldn't see him. It was a pillar of cloud. And in the flesh, we may not always see how close we really are associated with God. With these eyes, we not, may not be able to understand how close God really is to us if we were to take advantage of it. But Paul was so much a Roman that just with the word, they didn't investigate it. They believe, he had a little bit of unction behind him. He said, I was free born, boys. Everything you ever wanted, I was born with. He said, Caesar would listen to me just as much as he'd listen to you. Well, I have the ear of the one that created everything. He tells me to cast all my cares upon him, for he cares for me. I'd rather be a... But see, Paul, just because you have the right to something or a claim to something doesn't mean you utilize it sure. we can have associate we can have fellowship we can have a relationship we can walk hand in hand with Christ as he desires it to be in the eyes of God it was predestined that everyone that was saved would be conformed to the image of the son we can look so much like Christ that when God looks at us he can't tell the difference that's what he desires when we're robed in his righteousness, that's what he sees in the spirit. 
But we can walk that close to God. Or else God wouldn't have pinned it down because it wouldn't have been possible. One day it will be because I have a body like His. I've got limitations down here with the flesh and with sin and the things that didn't get saved. But one day I will be. But so many people don't claim it and are not associated with Him and live so far below. They get beat up by the world every day. They're bound with leather thongs that the world puts on them and they think they can't break. Well, you may not be able to. Paul didn't set himself free. The Romans set him free. Somebody gave the order and they cut the leather off of them. Well, because of my association, Paul didn't get freed, but he was loosed. And for the rest of his journey, never do we find that the Apostle Paul was limited on where he could go because the centurion always trusted him. He could go and talk to people. He, the centurion rented an own house out of his own pocket to give him a place to stay once they got to Rome so that he could have church meeting with people that came to see him. He wasn't free because he'd been bought with a price. But he was loosed. Rome couldn't do nothing to him. world couldn't do nothing to him. Because God said you can't do nothing to him. Yet. If we get associated with the one that everybody claims that they want recognition from, they want a title from, they want something from. Everybody wants something from somebody. And deep down in their soul, they cry out and they, they say, you know, hey, I want this, I want that. They may not think that they're asking God for it, but really they're just looking for their own God that will give them whatever it is that they want. They want to be associated with something that makes them feel like they belong. Well, before I even got up from saying the prayer, on the night that I got saved, in the eyes of God, I was already threefold the child of God. He already had a position for me, had a name for me. He saw me robed in the flesh and in new heaven and new earth with the position that through Christ Jesus, He's going to give me. Did I realize that when I got saved? Nope. But I'm glad, I may not have perfected it, but I'm glad I know how to associate it a little bit with God. But you were born with it, but you got to use it. Next, well, some people sell their souls for a claim. They want esteem from others. I think of the Pharisee that Jesus said as he was praying openly in the temple about everything that he had done for God that week. How much he gives to God throughout the week. Jesus said that man has his reward. He wanted the acclaim of men. But the center boy over in the corner who spoke himself on the chest saying, Lord, have mercy on me. He said that boy did business with God. He got recognition, he got acclaim from God. What, did he get praise for his sinful act? No. But God looked at him and said, that boy used the, that kernel of faith that I gave him, that measure of faith, he put it into me. He came into the house of God. He knew that that's where he'd get his answer. He knew that he couldn't pray away his sin, so he asked God to take him away for him. He said, he did right because he did it the way that God said which was a way of faith Pharisee was trying to give to get a claim Pharisee was trying to impress people to get a claim Center boy just said I can't deserve the acclaim Lord but I do know that you promised to take away my and I'm going to ask you to do it have mercy on me and said, I can't earn it but Lord show it to me because I have faith that you have in mind what's best for me you've already planned it all out but what if nobody ever knows my name? It should be enough that God knows your name. How many people did the Apostle Paul meet that forgot about him? I don't know. But there's a whole bunch that remembered him because he wrote a whole bunch of letters to him that eventually became a part of your Bible. Did Paul earn that acclaim? No. God blessed him with it. What about Titus? What did Titus do to deserve to be a bishop or a preacher? A part missionary with the Apostle Paul. Someone that helped bear the burden and continue on after the Apostle Paul had been taken to heaven. What'd he do? Nothing. What did Noah do? Nothing. He found grace in the eyes of God. You get a claim with God by submitting. I mean, Jesus said if he be lifted up, he'd draw all men to him. That's all the acclaim that I care about. 
But God blesses those that are obedient. God blesses those that submit. God blesses those that do as he commanded. And people will take note. That's why, I mean, that's why as they're putting him on trial, the Apostle Paul said, he's giving his testimony of everything that happened. He starts telling me, hey, I was on the road to Damascus one day, and there's a light. It came out of nowhere. He said, and out of the light, a voice spoke to me. And I said, Lord, who art thou? He said, I'm Jesus Christ. He said, the men that were on the road with me, they saw the light. Go ask them. He said, they didn't hear the voice, but they saw the light. If you get so closely associated with God that light just starts shining around you, people are going to notice. They may not understand it because they came back and said, hey, a light came out of nowhere and Paul got such a good shot of it, he went blind. They saw all the time. They said, we don't know what happened, but a great light came out of heaven. Well, the Apostle Paul shows up and said, hey, they saw it. They didn't know what was going on. He said, I didn't know what was going on. At the time, he said, in hindsight, I get it. But if we get so closely associated, that light just starts shining, people are going to notice. They, they'll take a claim. They may not give you the credit because we don't deserve it. You may never have somebody come up and say, wow, you're such a great person. But if you get so close to Jesus that they say, wow, that's Jesus, I want a piece of that. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. If we get that close, that's all the acclaim that I care about. How many times did the Apostle Paul testify of the things that he had done? Zero. How many times did the Apostle Paul say, well, because I did this, God was allowed to bless? No. He said, all these bad things happened to me so that God could get me to the place where he could use me. That thorn in the flesh was given to me so I could appreciate grace. He didn't care about what people thought of him. He just cared what people thought about God because of what they had heard or seen in his life. People want their name up in light. Well, I was born with a new possession. I don't care about this world. I'm laying up gold, silver, and precious gems for the kingdom of heaven. I ought not care what people think because all that should care is what Jesus thinks. Well, some people, all that they want is they want adoration. They want love. And along with it, they want happiness. They want joy. They want to feel like somebody out there truly cares about them. That one person... When the night is long, when they don't know what to do, they can pick up the phone, they can talk to that person, and they can know that that person truly listened and gave them honest feedback. They just want to know that somebody's out there for them. In fact, I studied one time back when I was in college and giving speeches. When they threw Paul and Silas into the inner prison, that was solitary confinement back then. And Romans, back in the day, they just wouldn't throw you into the middle prison if you were going to be there for an extended period of time. Sometimes they'd put people there because they were like, well, they're going to be here at night. We're going to make them miserable. But if you were in a big boy prison and you was going to be chained up for a while, they'd start you off in general population. And they'd move a group of men to the inner prison. And one by one, they'd remove them. Until that one guy who got the sentence is sitting there and he's seeing all the empty chains on the wall. He's thinking of all the conversations that he used to have. And because of the memory of not being alone, it made his loneliness more severe. It played tricks on his mind. Because if they just separated him and threw him into the cell, he'd always been alone. But they'd leave him with some friends and then rob him of that friendship. But what does the world do? They chain you, but they convince you that you're not chained because you got some friends chained with you. And by the time all the friends are gone, because they're in chains, they don't, they're not free, they got to go wherever the jailer tells them. By the time you realize that you're ensnared, you look around and you think, well, they were ensnared, and they were ensnared, and you realize that all of it was a sham. And you're broken, you're defeated, you'll do whatever you want. There are prisons in Russia today where the 
height of the ceiling in the cells is about four feet tall. You have to sit down in order to get your back to where it's stretched out. And the cell's about five and a half feet long. That means that if you're about as tall as me, you can't lay down and stretch out. You can never get comfortable. When you walk around the prison, it's called Black Dolphin uh, Prison. You walk around the prison, you have to put your hands behind your waist, bend at the waist until you're at a 90 degree angle, and the guard will grab your hands to keep you from falling over. You have to walk everywhere like that if you're outside of your cell. What is it? They've broken that man. He can't ever stand up straight. He can't feel proud of himself. He can't boast just by taking a stretch, sitting down. He can find no temporary... And even when he gets into a hallway that's tall enough for him to stand, they make him bend over. That's what the world does. They promise you affection, but by the end of it, they've got you in subjugation. But they go around, they try everything, only making themselves more a prisoner just trying to find somebody that cares. Just trying to find something that makes them happy for a little bit. When I was born into a family with a God that is love, I freely was given the adoration of God. Every man was. For God so loved the world. They don't realize it, but there's somebody that cares about it more than ever. But now that you're saved, you can receive the love of God as God intended you to. Before you have an association, you can't receive it. Before God can love on you, you got to get that thing out of the way. What's that? That was sin. And even after we get saved, if sin comes in, I can't receive the love of God the way that God intends me to receive it. That love may come through chastisement. But if we want the good kind of love that we enjoy, we've got to keep that clear. Got to maintain it. But then, every day may not be happy, but I can have joy. Because if God gets to loving on me, fruit of the Spirit, first one, love, second one, joy. I'm going to start loving like God loves, and I'm going to have joy. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. So then I'm strong, even though the world may try to put me into chains, I know the one that's the chain breaker. Even though I may be ensnared, I know the one that's stronger than anything I'm ever going to face. I may be beset on all sides with foes like the Apostle Paul. That's why the centurion took him. He said, they're going to tear this boy apart limb from limb because he stirred him up. He got him so angry arguing about whether there is an afterlife or whether it isn't an afterlife that they're going to kill him for bringing the subject up. Beset on all sides. And the apostle Paul knew that was going to happen. He was there the day that they stoned Stephen. Stephen started preaching to him so good that they got so angry they tried to trample him inside of the courthouse. Then they took him outside and stoned him. They just wanted the conviction. To stop. They wanted the pain to stop. They were ready to run Stephen over, tear the Apostle Paul apart. Why? Because they wanted to live in their delusion and just find happiness. They just wanted associate. They were like, hey, we got a title. These people care about each other. This is St. Hedron Council. These are the top of the top brass in the eyes of the Jews. And he's saying, shut up, Paul. We were happy until you came up and showed us that we were in chains. We want to ignore you because we want to go back to ignorance is bliss. Well, bliss will send you to hell, but God's love can save us, baptize us into the one water of the Word, fire of the Holy Spirit. But then us be born into that new creature. What's that new creature get? Love. Joy. Everything that the world has ever craved for deep down in their soul. You know what it is? Man's soul cries out in agony because it remembers that once it walked with God in the cool of the day in the garden. And it craves that adoration, that love from God, and that joy of just spending time with God. It knows it was not intended to be afflicted and to be cursed with sin. That's why wherever you go, somebody's worshiping something because they want that relationship that they know they're missing. Well, I can have it. But then, we don't have time to go through all of them. So let's skip down here. 
the world endeavors. They seek, they crave information. Doesn't matter what kind of information. Some people get so obsessed with sports that all they want are stats. They want to know the line of what this person averages, how many shots they take a game, in practice, how many times they missed that week, Brother Randy. They want to know if somebody's going to get hot. They put all this effort into learning everything so that maybe when March comes around, they can fill out that one perfect bracket that you've got like a one in seven quadrillion chance of ever filling that thing out and getting it perfectly right the first time around, and then you'll just win a million dollars. There are people that go down to racehorse tracks and throw money away hoping that they finally get that perfect trifecta. There are people that invest time in trying to acquire knowledge because they think that knowledge is what they're missing. Used to, people would try to acquire land here on earth. They thought that possessions would be what they want. Well, Brother Randy, there are people that have got eyes set, not just on getting land here. Talk to a guy named Elon Musk. He wants Mars. He's that dude that launched a rocket with like a red Mazda or Tesla, what it was what it was, with a little space dummy in the seat. And he live streamed that car being shot into space from this little rocket. He's the one that SpaceX thing where he's trying to find rockets that can fly themselves. And then they all keep tipping over over in the ocean and exploding. People just aren't satisfied anymore on what they can have here. They're thinking, well, maybe the answer's on Mars. You know why they're thinking? Because they've tried everything else down here. Hadn't been working for people. They've invented new things to occupy their attention. There are You can spend tens of thousands of dollars, a whole bunch of time in a classroom, a whole bunch of time out of it, to get a degree in something that somebody made up. You know what humanism is? It's the belief that man's so good that we should study man. You know who made that up? Man. You know what the original education was? Man's not worth it. Follow God. That's what Adam taught to Cain and Abel. Both of them got that education. Adam got that education and still chose not to associate with God. The original education was God's all you need. But then throughout the years, there are those that buy into that. I mean, even before Noah gets on the ark, they've invented false gods already. They're worshiping themselves or worshiping other things that they've made up. And at that point, I don't know, Bob doesn't cover it, Garden of Eden's probably still around somewhere. God hadn't remade the earth yet. That angel's probably still at the gate with that fiery sword keeping people from coming in. But instead of going back and just checking and saying, hey, does this place really exist? Instead of doing that, they just said, now we're going to make up our own history. We're going to make up our own truths. We're going to make up our own lifestyles. And what did that get them? A watery death. Then even after Noah gets off the boat, his own sons, one of them, being wicked, it's cursed, but everybody that lived came from Noah. So where did the cultivation or the civilizations come from that brought up Baal or brought up Diana or started worshiping Tamas or started all of these false religions where'd they come from the same place that the people that remained faithful to the things of God came from but man's pursuit of knowledge something new something different because everything I know isn't making me happy everything I know isn't satisfying me everything I've tried isn't going to get me a name that's up in lights Everything that I've tried hasn't brought anybody important into my life, so I've got to try something different. Got to try something new. And some people become a slave to the pursuit of knowledge. Everything they learn doesn't satisfy, so they've got to pick up another book. They've got to try something else. They've got to sign up for another webinar for something. They've got to look into all these websites where you can learn new crafts and learn new things. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong. Doing it for fun. Just to release, Sydney bought a stupid puzzle. It's got over a thousand pieces to it. And she said, well, mom said, hey, do you want to do a puzzle with the family? You know who's done most of the puzzle? Sydney. And you know who's done the most? Me. In that order. And I was the one that said, no, I don't want a puzzle because I'm going to end up putting it together. 
Taya put together more of it than anybody else probably after that. And then Christian just looked at it and went, <laughs> nope. What's the point? Things that you think will start off as fun. Nothing wrong with it. But when fun is replaced with that craving desire, you need something new. You become obsessed with it. People are obsessed with finding that one TV show on Netflix that's going to make them relax for about 20 minutes. Well, after you stress about trying to get through all of Netflix to find the one thing that you actually want to watch, you're not going to feel like watching a movie or watching a TV show. There are some people that are just obsessed with the feeling of being angry at the world. It makes them feel better, superior to everything. They go out and learn just to go and tell other people how wrong they are. That's a miserable life. But some people go through it because they think one day I'll know enough to make everybody realize that I'm better than they are. That's what the Pharisees were afraid of losing in Jesus' day. Everybody else's recognition. They said, we know so much that we could keep everybody else below. We could keep our position because we know so much about the things of God and people come to us to ask for answers. Well, when Jesus said, you can go to God and ask for answers, they didn't know what to do. So they tried to kill him. Succeeded for three days. Well, no, they didn't because he laid down his life. But anyway, they thought they won for three days. Three nights. Well, what happened? They got a little bit of education on that Sunday morning when they found out, oh, we, we can't keep God wherever we put God. Some people get an education in how to go to God, get your sins forgiven, and then you can go out and live however you want to. There's no satisfaction in that because it's a lie. I mean, there are people that are so-called Baptists that believe you can live however you want to because it's under the blood. There are Baptists that believe that regardless of what you can, you know, you can do, you, you better be careful, you can lose your salvation. So you've got to learn how to avoid doing that. Brother Randy, I'm glad we don't teach that class. I'm glad I've got peace. I've got an anchor within the veil. But that, I know that I know that I know that I know. Because I'd spend a whole lot of nights wondering if I was, if I wasn't sure. Education will make a mess of everything that God had planned. Because you know what education really boils down to? Some education is truth. Well, what's that? That's wisdom, as the Bible would call it. That's knowledge. That's instruction under righteousness. Doing math's good, because then you can balance a checkbook. Right? But, Sister Crystal, I'm sorry. I don't get calculus. What is the point of it? When am I going to need that in my daily life? I'm sure calculus has helped the people that design the tires that go on the car that I drive or something like that. Maybe. I don't know. But I'm pretty sure I'd have been okay with a horse. I don't know. Probably not. Right? Well, what's the, what's the real meaning then behind knowledge? Well, real, not, I mean, real knowledge, truth, wisdom. That's not what we're talking about. Things that can be taught to you. They're things that man made up to make man seem smarter. What is the study of philosophy? A whole bunch of dudes that were just out in the field wondering about things one day. What is the study of psychology? We're going to try and figure out the brain even though we can't really understand all of it. You know that scientists still can't figure out why people need to sleep every night? There's nothing that according to your body says if you don't sleep you're going to die but if we don't sleep we don't die I mean we're going to die the only reason that scientifically they could come up with the reason that you need to sleep every night is because you get tired you would think with all the billions and trillions of dollars that have been put into the medical community over the years they can't figure out why your brain just needs to shut off for a little bit but I can tell you I don't find anywhere that Adam and Eve slept Sin's what caused you to start sleeping. Maybe that time that some people... I mean, you, you don't have to hang around me long to figure out I'm not a morning person. Doesn't matter how much sleep I get. I hate mornings. You know what it is? It is the flesh saying, I want to go back to doing nothing. It's the flesh saying, I want to be like the dirt that I came from. I don't want to get up. I don't want to go. I don't want to deal with traffic and everything else just let me be dirt because before the curse of sin came 
It wasn't dirt. In the eyes of God, that was going to be an everlasting, eternal body that Adam would have had for all of everything. All eternity. But when Adam sinned, it knew, i got to go back to being dirt. Yeah. That bone, the tendons, the flesh, everything knew, I'm going back to the dirt. The only thing that knew it would be eternal was the soul. Even then, why do people have a natural fear of fire? A lot of good comes from fire. Heat, warmth, you can cook things on it. Right? God gave fire as a tool. But why is there such an ingrained fear of fire into people? Because somewhere, the soul knows there's an everlasting pit with fire that can't be quenched. People aren't afraid of drowning like they are of burning. People aren't afraid of flying like they are of burning. And the thing about fire, just when you think you've got it under control, you let your guard down, something bad happens. Just when you think you've got a grip on your eternity, in hell, he opened up his eyes being in torment. You can learn enough to think you're okay only to find out you didn't know nothing. The world wants truth, they want not. I've got the very words of God. Not a man's interpretation, not somebody's, you know, opinion on what God said doesn't contain what God said with some addition to it. No, no, no. Everything God desired for me to know to live a life of association and adoration and where I appreciate my new life that I was given and take full advantage of my citizenship in a heavenly land. Yeah. It's right here. Yeah. Don't have to go through anybody. I'm glad that he gave us pastors, that he gave us you know, evangelists, missionaries, people that come in every now and then and be like, hey, God showed me this. And wow, I never knew that. I'm glad he gave us an under-shepherd that watches for our souls. I'm glad that he gave us a church where we can be a called-out assembly of people, stupid governor, and fellowship but if God took it all away I can still go right here because he's right here and this is what I desire you know what the apostle Paul desired to know what God would have him to do God said go to Damascus you're going to meet a guy by the name of Ananias he said Ananias come up Ananias as far as I know never knew Saul of Tarsus never knew what the you know, he looked like, didn't know the way that he walked, didn't even have a description for it, but he walked up to him and called him Brother Saul. You know why? God said, hey, that's one of your brothers. Go talk to him. Soon as he got in, he had association. That's my brother in Christ. Soon as he got in, God changed other people's opinions. Don't confuse this with name it and claim it. Don't confuse this with, well, if I want it, I can say I'm a child of the king and go out and God's going to give it to me. Well, if it's God's will. But my job isn't to be concerned with things. My job is to be concerned with him and he'll take care of the rest. But if I don't take advantage of being a child of the king, if I don't take advantage of having God's adoration constantly available, if I don't take advantage of the association that I can have with God, then I'm going to start looking for answers and teaching myself things that aren't true. I'm going to start looking for people to justify what I want to know so that I can feel better and all the while getting further and further away from God. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.